Hello and welcome to my talk, Challenges Using Azure Kubernetes Service. My name is Daniel Karnuch. I'm a software engineer for Vivid Planet. I'm heavily interested in cloud security and software architecture. And we as Vivid Planet are a software development company in Hendorf near Salzburg. We are currently around 60 people and we are developing custom software solutions for large enterprises, mostly around the web, but not only. And today I'm going to talk about challenges we had while using Azure Kubernetes service. And at first I would like to start with answering the question why you would choose Azure Kubernetes service at all. And after that, I would like to talk about three challenges we had in the last two years while adopting to Azure Kubernetes services, which are infrastructure as code, costs and capacity planning. So at first, what are your options if you want to host uh, Kubernetes? So if you want the most flexibility and you have the required workforce and can handle the complexity, you can start on the top right corner with hosting Kubernetes on-premise. This means you bring your own hardware, for example, using your own data center and you are de deploying Kubernetes managed by you. So you are have you, so you have everything under control from hardware to Kubernetes to everything in between. If you don't have that required workforce to handle that complexity, you can trade a bit of that complexity for less flexibility by going into the public cloud. So at first you can start with using Kubernetes in the public cloud. This means you're still deploying Kubernetes on your own, but you're renting the hardware from a public cloud provider. This gives you the flexibility that you don't need to actually buy the hardware and you don't need to manage the hardware and you can exchange the hardware. So you're leveraging the options the public cloud provider offers, but you still have full control over Kubernetes and you can do everything as you like. And the next option would be to actually go for an managed Kubernetes service in the public cloud. So this means that the public cloud provider is doing the deployment of Kubernetes, handles some of the complexity for you, and you have to worry about less stuff. And still, you need to figure out routing or load balancing, and you have to set up maybe multi-tenancy or security stuff. And if you want uh, to have uh, more support, then you can use a platform as a service tool like Red Hat OpenShift in the public cloud, which handles, for example, routing for you, but you then have the least uh, flexibility possible. So we actually went for managed Kubernetes in the public cloud. And the reasons for that are that this provides enough flexibility for us. So we are a small team. We don't have the workforce to handle all the complexity and we are fine with uh, some trade-offs. And the main reason for us going to the public cloud is that we would like to have easier access to other public cloud services, for example, managed databases or storage services. And in the recent years, managed Kubernetes has become a lot better. So um, the public cloud provider is doing a lot of stuff for you and you can start by just deploying your applications. And this means usually for managed Kubernetes, for example, in AKS or Google Kubernetes Engine, you won't have access to the control plane components and the control plane components are managed by the public cloud provider. You can rely on same defaults that the public cloud provider is offering and some of the administrative tasks are handled by the public cloud provider. For example, you can enable automatic uh, Kubernetes version upgrades if you would like. And now I want to talk about the challenges we had. And the first challenge we had is infrastructure as code. While this is not directly related to the Azure Kubernetes service, it shows what problems can occur if you're using a managed service. So um, at first, quick recap, if you are not familiar with infrastructure as code, the CNCF glossary defines it as storing the infrastructure definition in one or more files. And this brings you some benefits. And these benefits are the obvious benefits of version control system. So you can use your 
um, usual workflow that you also use for your source code. You have your uh, history, you can use all the uh, contribution functionality that version control systems offer. And also if you have the configuration in files, you have the option to repeat stuff. So you can tear down your infrastructure and bring it up back again. You can also bring up another environment. You just make a copy of the configuration files and this uh, speeds up the process and is also less error prone. Also, if you're already leveraging CI CD pipelines, for example, to deploy your applications, you can use the same pipelines to actually deploy the infrastructure as well. And you are benefiting by uh, using that, what you already have. And popular tools for infrastructure as code are, for example, Terraform and Puluvi. Uh, we have chosen Terraform. And why, while we are big fans of uh, infrastructure as code, there can occur some problems. And these problems namely are, um, for example, different defaults. So if you're using the Terraform provider, for example, for Azure Kubernetes service, this has, the provider has default values. And these default values might not necessarily represent the default values that the public cloud provider is currently offering. So we, for example, had the problem. We were using um, the OS disk type mentioned in the slides and the Terraform provider defaults to managed disks. But these are not recommended due to uh, lower performance. So we um, would like to use ephemeral disks, but we did not um, watch out for the default value and we went with the wrong value. So it can happen that actually the Terraform provider is not adapting to recent changes from um, the public cloud provider and you need to watch out for the default values. And this also brings us to the uh, second problem that if you want to change such a value, we've seen before, it might not be possible with Terraform. And this is also a problem we had actually. So you have your default node pool um, for your cluster, which um, mainly handles central stuff, do central stuff from the cluster. And this um, default node pool um, you is requiring to uh, that you specify a VM size and you maybe want to change the VM size due to higher demand or due to a new generation being released. And if you try to make that change using Terraform, then you see on the right side that the Terraform plan actually suggests that it will um, tear down the default node pool and this will also tear down the whole cluster. So if you make that change to the default node pool, your whole cluster will be recreated. This usually means that you have uh, downtime for your applications and this is not what you want. So Terraform is suggesting that it is not possible to actually make that change, but there is actually a way to change that. So what you can do is you can go either to the UI or using the Azure CLI and you can create a new temporary system node pool, which works as the default node pool. Then you delete the old default node pool because you always need one um, system node pool in your cluster. And afterwards you create the new default node pool with, with the change of the VM size that you wanted to do. Now you can um, delete the temporary node pool and you have successfully exchanged the default node pool. Um, this happens with zero downtime, so it's uh, possible to do that in production without any outages. But you need to somehow tell Terraform that you made that change because Terraform is stor storing the current configuration in a Terraform state and you need to modify the state manually to actually t tell Terraform that you have made changes to the default node pool. And you can do that by manually editing the um, Terraform state file and then if you rerun your Terraform plan, it will actually um, say that there are no changes to the infrastructure and you have successfully exchanged the default node pool, even though the Terraform provider at first told you this is not possible. So some changes that um, are not possible with Terraform are possible in different ways. So um, be aware of that. And this brings us to the second challenge.
And the second challenge is costs and cost estimation. So there's this famous saying that prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. And this is uh, really true for cloud costs as well. So when you have your first naive approach and you look at the documentation, um, you might um, get the hint that you only need to pay for the nodes in your cluster. So you look up the VM prices and you have your estimation. And this is true, but this is not the whole story. So you additionally might need an SLA because your customers are uh, requiring an SLA. So you need to back your components as well. So you need to pay for an SLA. You might also need some sort of support plan because cloud providers have gotten really strict about what you can uh, ask support. And it's usually only billing related stuff and you need an additional support plan to actually ask questions or to use uh, resources from their side. And also you might have uh, special requirements for networking. This could be, for example, that you are using uh, a static IP address. So you need uh, all your traffic from occurring from one uh, IP address. So you might need um, some, some networking components and these networking components can be tough to estimate upfront because they are usually um, priced on bandwidth base. So the more traffic um, you have, the more you're going to pay. And this is really hard to estimate upfront. Also, um, you might need components for observability. So um, you want to know the exact usage of resources your containers are using in production and you need uh, additional tools for that. And also these tools are usage based. So it depends how many containers you are deploying and how many um, log lines you want to store. And this is also uh, tough to estimate upfront. And even if you have your estimation, um, it can be even tougher to assign the costs than to some sort of cost location or if you have a multi-tenant setup to some projects because you can divide the node costs based on, for example, uh, resource requests, but you still need to divide the linear costs, um, for example, the networking stuff and ob observability stuff, which is usage based, and this can be really tough. So what you can do about that is I would su suggest to treat the node costs as absolute lower bound. So, um, we actually were off by 100%. So the node costs are 50% of our cluster costs. So it's uh, really far off. And I would suggest to treat that as an absolute lower bound. Also, um, if you can uh, afford it, I would also recommend to run a near production ready setup for a longer period and use that as your estimation. So it's easier to just set up everything have it uh, running for a couple of weeks or months and then use this as an estimation because it's really hard to do that upfront. And by analyzing the costs, you can divide the costs into fixed and linear parts. So when you're starting with adopting uh, Azure Kubernetes service, you have some fixed costs and afterwards you have linear costs um, with each application. So divide that and be aware of that. And also there have been uh, developments in uh, FinOps movement, which provide interesting solutions for cost assignment and also for um, handling cost savings and they help you reduce your cloud bill, which can be uh, really good. And this also brings us to the third challenge we had and the third challenge is capacity planning. And there's also another famous saying there that there is no cloud, it's just somebody else's computer. And this somebody else might be a big corporation, but still, still somebody needs to manage the uh, computer. And what can happen is that certain node types can become unavailable. So they either might be uh, not available due to high demand or the cloud provider might deprecate them due to newer versions being released. And this means that you need to change your, um, you need to change your node, uh, nodes, for example, and, and your node pools. And this, uh, can actually happen. And also, um, if you would have asked me a couple years ago, 
I would not imagine that uh, public cloud regions can become full, but we actually had that, that due to higher demand in cloud computing overall, there are some certain regions um, which experience such high demand that you can't get additional resources deployed. And this can be really tough to tackle. And also if you're using reservations or committed usages, which you should because it helps to reduce your bill, they can make, make you inflexible because you need to stick with um, certain products or node types because you've bought the reservation and you can't always adapt to um, newest versions because you have your reservations in place. So what you can actually do about that, uh, the obvious thing is to migrate to a, a different region with uh, less usage, um, but this can be tough in uh, different ways. So this might introduce uh, additional latency because you are um, you're far away. And also this can introduce latency for the application itself if your cluster is stateless. So if you, for example, have your databases outside of the cluster and you want to migrate the cluster, the database stays in the region and this introduces latency. So you either have to accept the latency, additional latency, or you migrate the databases as well. And this is, um, this is not, not the ideal solution. So be, be careful with that. And also I would recommend to increase quotas uh, early and generously. So make a um, good estimation how many nodes you need. Um, try out if you can uh, really use that amount of nodes and keep some nodes in space for, for example, cluster upgrades or you um, needing a different cluster, for example, for exciting new customer or due to um, seasonal high traffic, for example. And with that, I want to conclude my talk. I want to thank you for listening. And you have, if you have any questions or remarks, you can reach me on Twitter and LinkedIn. And thanks for tuning in.